Maybe some background laughter would be nice. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I'll be like uh, Stephen Colbert's wife that sits on the outside of the screen and laughs. Do you? <laughs> We know what that bus, that bus route looks like. We know what that hike looks like to the shelter with all your stuff. We know what it feels like to get rained on and, and snowed on. Hello Boulder and the wider world. This is the Sharing Boulder podcast. My name is Philip Ogren, and for episode 11, I sat down with Jennifer Livovich at a park in southeast Boulder. Jen is the founder and executive director of Feet Forward, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides services to individuals experiencing homelessness. As a person who has experienced homelessness herself, Jen has deep connections with Boulder's unhoused population and leverages her first hand knowledge to provide services that are thoughtful, compassionate, and meet people where they are at. I really appreciate Jen's no-nonsense, pragmatic approach, and I learn a lot from our conversation. This episode of Sharing Boulder was recorded in front of a live audience of one, my wife, Akane Ogren, who despite her initial intentions of watching quietly, joined in on the conversation several times along the way. Near the end of the conversation, a young man who was perhaps unhoused approached us and asked for drugs. The audio is not great during this segment, but I left this exchange in the podcast for reasons that I hope will be clear when you keep listening. At the end of the episode, and in the show notes at sharingboulder.us, there is a list of things you can do to help the homeless today here in Boulder. Some of them are small and simple, and some of them are big and complicated. We hope that you are inspired by this episode with Jennifer Livovich of Feet Forward. Hello, uh, welcome to Sharing Boulder. I'm with uh, Jen Livovich, who is the executive director of Feet Forward. So thank you so much for taking time. You were telling us about how busy your schedule is right now with school and other engagements. And so I really appreciate that you carved out some time this evening to, to talk with us. Absolutely. Yeah. So Thank you. can you um, maybe just start off by giving us a sketch of Feet Forward and what that's all about? Sure. So uh, Feet Forward is a Boulder-based nonprofit, a 501c3. Um, we are peer-led. Um, myself and about 50% of our core volunteer staff have previous experience in homelessness place based right here at Boulder. Um, we provide a weekly event that provides hot food through a program I created called It Does Not Take a Holiday. It Does Not Take a Holiday. Because oh, we believe everyone deserves a hot meal um, on, on any day. Uh, and not, so, just, not just Christmas Eve is what you Not just saying. Thanksgiving, yeah. not just... Um, <laughs> And so I, I started that program in January of this year, and um, I partnered with some local restaurants like Sancho's Authentic Mexican Restaurant. Um, Sean Camden is a tremendous individual, and uh, he has been basically my ride or die uh, out there in freezing weather um, and the hottest, hottest of days. Uh, Rosati's Pizza in Louisville also provides foods and then some faith-based organizations as well. Um, so weekly, weekly we're providing hot meals for 100 people. And where, where does that take place? So when the weather is bad and nobody wants to be at the parks, we are at the Boulder Van Show. Um, currently we are utilizing as much shade as possible and so we are near 13th Street across from Deshambi Tea House. Uh, our events are community based and so because I am previously unhoused here right in Boulder I have somewhat lengthy and unique histories with some of our local service providers and so our relationships have evolved and they become more of professional networks if you will and also friends 
And so at our events, we are currently hosting and we have been hosting a multiple, multiple local service providers uh, who come to our events, uh, they peruse the crowd, um, and so do they set up a poster, or a, are they, they're just there with maybe flyers or? It's all or, very informal, okay. uh, and um, they are meeting clients where they're at, yeah. and this is helping to expedite housing processes. This is uh, helping to identify people who may be prioritized for housing, who let's say are off the grid, uh, or not engaged with services, and so it's it's really become it's not a feed. Uh, we provide a, mul a multitude of resources based on whatever I have donated uh, that's weather appropriate. And um, more recently, we created a portable charging station because charging phones is a large challenge for people outside. And then we also started to offer haircuts. Oh, nice. It's incredible, um, you know, when you get a haircut, anyone feels better and I when call you it, I call it haircut high you know when you right uh, and you so can, you can get up earlier and stay up later and you feel better so the name of that program is called keep your head up haircuts cool. and um, and it's really taken off and you can just see a difference in a person before they get their haircut and after and we've had one of our most recent haircuts um, actually get a job two days later wow. Nice. I know it's great. Yeah. So you you led off with this phrase peer led, and I think what you mean it's that's not a, a statement about the relationships within the organization. It's more a statement with about your relationships with the, the people you're providing service to. Is, is that right? So um, uh, because many people in your organization are were formerly unhoused. Correct. It's like you have that peer relationship. Um, you have that experience. You have that lived experience, right? So that so that you can relate to folks, um, right? In a, in a more meaningful way. So the term peer, actually, okay. So there are professional, there are actual professional roles that are considered para, paraprofessionals, and they originated in the mental health field. And so people who may have struggled with unmanaged mental health that were able to recover from that were, um, and they still are, present in mental health, are paid paraprofessionals that provide peer support for people who are still struggling with mental health. They're not clinicians. They um, sort of are, I don't know the best way to describe it. They're not clinicians. They walk alongside with a the person. They can be a mentor. They can be a um, realistic role model. Um, they have been proven to have a better connection with those that they support and um, and so more recently you've there's been an expansion for mental health and so they're starting to employ peer roles within the criminal justice system uh, primarily in community reintegration uh, there's also peer roles expanding in homeless services and then addiction with peer uh, recovery coaches. So, yeah, so when I say peer-led, what I mean is is that uh, we, the bulk of people who are providing these services have been there and done that, and all right here in Boulder. So we have an extensive history here, and one at maybe various times. And so we are able to relate to the people who are still outside. We know where they're camping. We know what that bus, that bus route looks like. We know what that hike looks like to the shelter with all your stuff. We know what it feels like to get rained on and, and snowed on, uh, personally. And, and, and removed, I assume. Uh, yeah, well, they weren't necessarily removing me like that when I was outside. I spent four and a half years, and I never, most people didn't use tents at that time, but criminalization was certainly in place. Yeah. Um, I can tell you from the number of presentations I've given, and because I have my own ability to gain my own records, 
um, in the height of my involvement with the police, I received 51 citations, largely associated to sleeping outside. I spent 266 nights in our jail uh, at $139 and some change every night. And so I cost our community a lot of money um, just because I didn't have a house. So, but there, there wasn't this um, ban on tents at that time, but people weren't using tents. Most of us were really using the built environment uh, and sleeping under maybe, uh, you know, extended roofs or even here, like yeah, for example. Mm hmm Yeah. This gazebo would have been great. Well, so... That, that, <laughs> it would have been great. Um, that, that actually um, makes me think of a question I've been kind of pondering as you've been talking, and that is... Um, so I, I was listening to a podcast uh, within the last couple of years that, that described um, um, homelessness as being mostly people sleeping in cars in, in a lot of communities and, and the, the kind of like the relative frequency of people like sleeping outside or sleeping in tents was somewhat lower, but or, or a lot lower, like for some suburban metropolitan areas, for example. But I'm curious if that's true in Boulder or if like are a lot of homeless people in, in their cars driving around from neighborhood, you know, to different na parking lots or? Okay, so there are definitely people that are living in their cars. Yeah. Um, in order to get, I mean, to get an accurate number of how many people are in their cars, is impossible. Yeah. Um, there are definitely people living in their cars. There is not a safe place for anyone to park. Yeah. So it's all about keep it moving. Uh, keep it moving and keep it moving. Uh, so having a car and being homeless is actually, it can be a hindrance. Yeah. Um, with that said, I can tell you that there are people who are living in cars who attend my Feet Forwards events on Tuesdays. Um, are they droves of people coming in cars? No. Um, but yes, there definitely are. There definitely are, and I couldn't begin to tell you how well, many people. Well, the, the reason I ask is because um, uh, one of the points that this other podcast made is that um, uh, because a lot of homeless people are, are mobile with their cars, it kind of hides the extent of the problem. Like, like you visibly see people that are in tents taking up residence along a creek path or, right. or whatever. But if that's only a small fraction of the entire problem, then uh, there's a there's a hidden aspect to homelessness that's that sort of like um, maybe I, I don't know maybe works against people being aware of just how big the problem is right and it's about to get bigger so uh, you know eviction protections are uh, you know gone except for people who have already applied for rental assistance and are in limbo with that um, I mean to speak to your question there is so every year HUD puts, selects a day, it's typically in January, and they call it the point in time count. And so this is, and every odd year are the numbers that you want to pay attention to. Because every odd year, every service provider, such as shelters, transitional housing, domestic violence, safe houses, or shelters, um, and then outreach efforts are made. They all, at the same time, across the nation, have people fill out these self-reporting surveys and from that is how they get a best guesstimate, if you will, of how many people are experiencing homelessness on that particular day and so they call that the point in time count. And so then it's, you know, obviously it's broken down and so Boulder, Boulder County for 2021, I believe those numbers were 676 people were experiencing homelessness in, in Boulder County. Well, I can tell you that um, it's always a largely undercounted. Yeah, that seems low. And, um, you know, I sit on our Continuum of Cares Regional Governing Council as a voting member, and I had a somewhat informational interview with the Executive Director, Matt Meyer, and I talked about this, the point in time count, because it does not give us, and really, it's a snapshot of who might be in the right place on the on that one day. Um, and so I wanted, I didn't, those numbers just never sat right with me. Yeah. And he said that 
pretty much a good way to get an idea of what your communities work you know in terms of population is to multiply that point in time count number by 1.4 or 1.5 so that would put boulder county at over a thousand okay that's both the entire county yes yeah. um however you know boulder has a larger presence of people who are unhoused you have to take into consideration that within our county, uh, you know, Lafayette and Louisville offer nothing in terms of services. They have no shelter. They, there's nothing there. And so people are left who are, who are actually homeless are left to have to choose between Boulder or Longmont. Interesting. Um, and so that's one contributing factor to why our numbers are higher. Um, there are probably some others as well. But it's my experience that people love Boulder. And, uh, you know, diverse, diverse people move here every single month. Some are housed and some aren't. And um, it's just gorgeous here. And um, I can speak to this. While I, was home, while I was unhoused in Boulder, you know, the rest of the unhoused community, we loved this place. I mean, we loved this community even though it didn't necessarily love us back. And we weren't going anywhere. Uh, and that, that, that can still be said about the unhoused, the unhoused community today. Once you, once you come here and it, it, it draws you in, um, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what policies are passed if the police are, you know, if the police are arresting people left and right or they're going to take their tent. Um, once people love Boulder, they, they love Boulder. They're, they're staying. Well, I wonder if there's an aspect of it where uh, they love each other, right? There's some community within the- uh, The unhoused, unhoused community? Yeah, the unhoused community. And, Absolutely. And, they, and so there's, is it, a, is it a friendly crowd? I mean, it's an interesting dynamic. So, you know, while I was in, spent, you know, the four and a half years I did in Boulder, you know, you develop these um, strong bonds. And, I mean, you're literally out there in elements where there's nights you don't even know if you're gonna survive. Um, you know, and you may have one or two blankets. I remember, you know, like sleeping in a dog pile with like six people, to, you know, sustain body heat with two sleeping bags over us. Um, you develop these bonds. I mean, it's, you don't do that with everybody, no. right? And what I've noticed, uh, so there's, so I, I de definitely knew that that was happening, like this sense of community, but I didn't realize how strong it was until I climbed out of homelessness. And I started to reintegrate back into what the normal world where, you know, I'd spent the bulk of my life in the normal world. And I thought, and I was working a part-time job and I had an emergency and I, I couldn't find anybody who would cover my shift or switch with me and it just reminded me like how the unhoused community of course I didn't have a job when I was in house but if I didn't have a blanket or I didn't have my socks were wet somebody was always multiple people stepping up to the plate saying Jen I've got you Jen I've or let me go find you a pair of shoes I mean and so it's just my time spent there was just like climbing out has been, it was just a gift. It was this gift in multiple ways because it taught me about community. I had no clue what that looked like or felt like before I became homeless. I would hate to, um, to idealize what homelessness is like. I've never experienced it myself. Um, I have spent a lot of time in apartments and houses, and um, I just know that a lot of people are feeling very isolated in those in those structures, right? They they like you just said, like you had you had a crisis where you didn't know who to call because you know you're probably in an apartment by yourself, for example. I hadn't I hadn't really thought about how like um, if you're in an unhoused population, there's no structural barriers like physical barriers between people. And so the possibility of having a, a dog pile, six people under, I mean, I'm not saying that was fun, but there, but the connection that you make sounds like that's 
meaningful. Is, is that, <laughs> is that is. okay to uh, ask? Well, <laughs> well, yeah, no, it is. Um, it is. And so one of the things um, that, that can be a large challenge for people who finally make it to prioritization for housing, because we're only, we're only housing about 10 to 12 percent of our unhoused community. That's not necessarily the fault of Boulder or Boulder County or the shelter. Uh, you know, if one of the things I really like to study uh, at Colorado State University is federal housing policy programs and funding sources. And so if you look at from like the top, you know, they're constantly under scrutiny, their budget's always on the chopping block. Um, and so they actually set this housing first as a national model. And, you know, without really the adequate resources to make it all happen. So it's not every person that you see who's outside today um, that's going to meet the prioritization involved to get housing. Yeah. But for those that do, it can be a tremendous challenge moving from one environment. Disorienting, you mean. Like and into another. And so I know, I know multiple people that struggle with that. You know, they feel claustrophobic. They um, can get depressed. If they already had depression, it's heightened. Um, some people who get into an apartment still sleep outside. Some people who get into an apartment have to have their windows open so they can hear the birds and the noise. Um, and so that transition can be very difficult. Some, And then here comes that piece of that loyalty, right? Those bonds that are developed. So now you're inside and it's snowing and it's freezing and you've got all your people you love outside. Ouch. It's tough. And so many people invite their people, basically their parks, to the apartments. And so what happens is it leads to negative community behaviors, right? Because things can get loud. Uh, you're not supposed to have guests over, uh, except for up to maybe 15, 15 nights out of the year. And so it, it's, it's a real, it's something that's not talked about. But it's something that I advocate for, which is peer support role for people who are transitioning from outside to inside and to also provide aftercare. Because some people have lost complete, complete touch with basic life skills. They don't even understand what an, an electric bill is. These things can be so overwhelming. And for many people, they don't get support services when they get housed. They literally get their apartment, and it's like, see you later. Yeah. So, I mean, that just speaks to those bonds. And so, for me personally, you know, the in-house community wasn't getting housed when I was homeless. The answer for people like me, because I had gotten those 51 tickets, I had this extensive relationship with the municipal court system, uh, was to send me to a program. And so... I was sent to a program in the middle of nowhere uh, and stayed there for 18 months it's called Fort Lyon. And when I went, my, my left foot was ready to fall off. I had frostbite, my foot was black, um, and that's what prompted me to go. I, it was my moment. Like seeing that on my foot, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not invincible. So what, I've stayed out here and survived four and a half years. I mean, my foot's falling off. And it was a, it was my moment. And I feel like people have moments. And so I went. And um, when I graduated, I was able to get some limited assistance for housing through the state. And I had to navigate all of that by myself, which was an invaluable learning experience. Uh, and I relocated back in August of 2018. And that was something I had to struggle with. Because while I was at that program, my friend Benjamin Harvey froze to death. They found him on Christmas morning uh, up on the hill. Um, you know, and I have, and I had just had, I made all these plans while I was gone in my head. But putting them into action when I came back, you know, and that sense of loyalty uh, was 
not as easy as, as it was when I was six hours away. Yeah. So um, that's when I started to collect socks under an initiative called Save a Toe. Saving Toes, Preventing Frostbite, and um, started to distribute them around the parks to all my people, right? All my people I sleep under bridges with. And it didn't take long before they, they stopped they stopped assuming I was going to like hang out or invited me to stick around. And um, so I didn't realize, but I was establishing my, reestablishing myself within my own community. Yeah. Um, and so that is kind of how, well, that was really the beginning of Feet Forward. So now if you can see the connection, it's Save oh. a Toe, <laughs> the little Feet Forward. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. So it's like, it's, um, <laughs> cause it's, it's like, uh, yeah. it's a nice metaphor to talk about walking and and making making forward momentum but i didn't i didn't realize there's a, like a literal connect, literal connection to feet with the name that's super cool Love it. yeah i mean and so the thing is is um, multiple people get frostbite every year yeah and while i was homeless um many people would say they had frostbite and i didn't believe it was a real thing i thought they were exaggerating and they were just cold but then i got it you yeah. know which is like I mean, that is, that, you know, that whole situation could be applied to a lot of things. So it's even like homelessness, right? So your house today, let's say you have a medical emergency and so, and you can't afford to, like something just happens. And now all of a sudden you, you have to rely on services for the first time. You don't even know what they are. Yeah. But once you get it, you learn real fast. <laughs> right once you have to use those resources you learn very quickly um so yeah so i have a, I have a question for you mm -hmm. do you have a do you have a community of friends that are formerly unhoused people um is it, are, are there a lot of people in your situation where the, you can look back and say that was my time being unhoused or is, is it really unusual to to come out of it and and, and have you know like you 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 seem like you're like you know tackling a new career and you have a place to live and um, uh, things things are looking better than they were when you were unhoused. Uh, and so, do you, are, is that unusual or is that is that a path that a lot of people are on? You know, I think it looks differently for everybody, and you know, a lot of people. So here's a here's a couple things I will say. The bulk. So I was raised in an upper middle class family. Education was always instilled in me. I grew up around diversity and culture and some nice stuff when I was growing up in near Chicago. Okay. Okay, so I some would say I had better life chances. Um even in my adult in my adult life, I worked in the private sector and leadership and was responsible and accountable uh for, you know, almost ten million dollars in sales annually. Um, you know, and That's I like under the company you work for. Yeah, yeah, I was a retail clothing and footwear buyer for a major independent re retailer. Um, you know, and so I, I like to tell this part of my story because it illustrates the point that none of us know what's around the corner in life. Yeah. Uh, I did that. I, I had that position for a decade, and then I left and got involved with corporate wireless sales. Um, and then I also, I just have a long history of cultivating relationships, uh, maximizing profit, uh, and so that's where my mind was at. My mind was about that. In my adult life, I continued to enjoy some finer things. You know, in 2003, I stayed at the Broadmoor. You know, and in 2013, I was sleeping under Arapahoe and Broadway Bridge. So... People, some people might say, well, what happened? Like, what happened? Like, how? Well, there's a, there's a few things that happened. Both my parents died when I was 20. I was thrust into like the real world without really having a full view of what that was. I had a 15-year-old sister. I rebounded from that quickly and professionally moved along. <laughs> but, you know, I would get, I would make unhealthy choices when it came to relationships, and it was just a series of things and things and things. And then finally, I was married in, in an abusive situation, and I had to make a choice, you know, which was like save my life and lose all my stuff, 
or uh, stay and you know who knows what take, might happen take a risk. Yeah. right and so that was that was my pathway um, to becoming homeless so I I just always like to say no one can be certain of what's around the corner and as a person that has done outreach in one form or fashion either through save a toe or with feet forward I can tell you that it's so diverse like each person has their own story and that's the unfortunate part about homelessness is that everyone gets grouped together like clumped together I never appreciated that well so that's a nice um, uh, th that gives me more caution about asking this next question because I sort of understand it there's no there's no short <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's no short answer but uh, but uh, maybe um, like just well, here's a, here's an exercise. You know, here's a here's a magic wand that you can wave around. Um, how do you solve homeless homelessness? How do what, I solve them? Yeah, how what, do we what, solve what, homelessness? Yeah, how, do, how do we do it? Um, what what's the what's well like? I, I mean, what there, would you there's. Like to see us try? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so as a pretty informed person um, on our on our service structure, um, as well as. I would consider myself rather proficient in, in federal policy. Uh, first of all, we don't have the housing stock. We don't have the housing stock. Um, we have a cash in lieu option, which, um, you know, is a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, we have these priorities and prioritizations in place for people who are unhoused um, to become housed. Yeah. Like I said, it's like that 10, 12 percent, and everybody else is just like, pay your dues, lose some toes, um, cost us a lot of money, and um, and then eventually you'll get there, right? And so, so what, um, I don't know if you know this, but but this this podcast is all about pro housing, better land use, and. Um, uh, I just have this really kind of fundamental belief that if we made more room for more housing in our community, our community would be more inclusive. It would be more beautiful. Like we've handed, we've handed the community over to cars and lawns, and a lot of that space could be used for affordable housing, for luxury condos, for all kinds of housing. And um, so I, I appreciate that you led off with that. We need more housing stock. It's like it just. I feel like the housing in Boulder is like a ladder where the last three rungs have been cut off and like to get to the first rung of housing is not an easy task. Um, well if you look, okay, so 2015 over 50 percent of our workforce didn't live here because they couldn't afford to live here. Yeah. And so when you think of inclusivity and community development, one of the aspects of that is is to draw people from outside your community in, in inward. Like you yeah. want to bring them into your community, right? That's inclusivity. Yeah. And we don't even have the housing stock for that particular group of people. So I have to say to myself, well, how how do we expect to house the unhoused community, right? We can't yeah. even we can't even we can't even house the people affordably. Are who are responsible for stimulating our local economy and so what you know I just wanted to touch base on this very quickly so we're looking at in terms of the unhoused community we're looking at 10 to 12 percent maybe it'll be a little bit higher right now because there's a specific voucher out maybe at this point we're might do 15 percent this year but if we know we know like the prioritization takes people years to be outside. Criminal justice involvement, high emergency reliance, right? We know and just exorbitant community costs. If we know this, unmanaged mental health, substance misuse. If we know all of these things, then why are we not trying to attack it on both ends? Yeah. Why are we only focused on the ten to fifteen percent of people? While everyone else is just on the wayside, costing everyone a lot of money and not being supported. And so my solution is alternative housing in 
in the form of a sober supported transitional housing community and what that would look like are single room occupancies with on site support services that had people like the peers of feet forward um, offering you know that uh, support as people walk along their journey I would have on site mental uh, mental health um, care educational opportunities employment opportunities and what we might see is a reduction in the people outside which would reduce our community costs because transitional housing also provides that layer a, a level of stability that people need to address their medical needs right in a more preventative style um, that would reduce emergency room reliance and just improve the overall health and wellness of not only the people that go there but also the broader community so we're sitting in this park um, across from Fraser Meadows which is this lovely facility housing facility for seniors and um, when I when I see that facility I sometimes wonder you know like we're able to as a society put together this beautiful housing for for aging seniors why can't we do that for um, transitional housing or for people who um, need an efficiency or a single bedroom apartment um, so uh, is, is that campus I mean does that does that uh, light up your imagination at all Are you kind of thinking something I mean, something, something more something, something more modest than that or I, I don't know I'm just uh, curious what it looks like well um, first of all it can't look like a correctional facility which is what some of these places try to do um, if you want to change behavior then you need to change like environment correct yeah. and um, yeah. and so what I'm what I what is something similar to that um, maybe without the big old the, it should the, be like the Tom's the Tom's shoe company where you know you have a, a company that can afford and if they buy one another one gets purchased right uh -huh. for some right who's unhoused. well, well one, one <laughs> thing because one thing I was thinking about this that I don't like is um, it segregates that population into this one giant place right and um, I was talking to an architect who's really interested in designing pro-social community structures right and he said that um, you know having uh, formerly unhoused people living in established communities is so much better for them than um, well or, or, or putting them all together in like one place so I mean like the, like this facility over here kind of makes me nervous in the sense of like it's just one more way to segregate people um, so I don't know I, uh, I would love to see lots of housing infill into our existing neighborhoods but. I'm going to tell you why that's my solution and because it's a uh, we could use an existing space to create it Medicaid also started to cover the inpatient cost for substance misuse treatment January of 2021 so I'm looking in terms of resources that are available. I'm looking at um, I'm looking at a solution that would not take a decade, you know, to happen. And I'm I'm also looking at it from a public health point of view, yeah. you know. And some people accuse me of having an emotional connection to our un unhoused community, and you know what I do. And yeah, you, you know better. what? Yeah, you Good. <laughs> Good. Because if I didn't, I realized when I moved back from that program that I am more helpful to the unhoused community being right here than I am being with them right in the parks. And, um, but if I didn't have an emotional connection to this community, in particular in Boulder, I wouldn't be doing any of this. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, when I come up with this, the, with those types of solutions, we could look at a hotel conversion. I mean, those are happening all across the yeah, nation. Do you have a dream one, property in Boulder that you'd love to convert? I mean, not particularly. We don't really have like this over representation of hotels. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I know I don't really. One of the, the challenges I've heard is that that North Boulder facility is so far from anything, right? It's on the outskirts of, of everything that any kind of, you know, support 
that the, <coughs> the unhoused community might need. And just getting there on a daily basis is such a challenge. As you mentioned, getting up the hill. It's, 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 um, it's not fun. Yeah. So uh, even on, even in about, nice weather. Yeah. When you talk about, you know, intermingle, like having them, you know, within the community, I, it could be one building, but bring it closer into the center of town. Well, I mean, right? it's deliberate. It's deliberately out of, uh, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that tends to be the case with uh, shelters or anything that might be viewed unsightly or un unwanted. Um, you know, many communities, not just here. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that walk, that walk isn't fun at all. They do have a free bus, but I mean, it's, I, I it's over driving. capacity. And yeah. it's, if you have mental health conditions or PTSD, it is not the best ride for you. Um, I mean, I feel like I remember taking that bus. I mean, I would rather walk than take that bus. Like, that terrible walk. You're talking about the, the, the skip or the 204? They, they it's both... a free bus that just oh, goes to the shelter. And so it's... It just picks up, ran, like, around, it has a No, nope, it has or... one... It, well, five o'clock, it picks up downtown, and you're not on it, you're out you're of luck. luck. And then the same bus leaves at 8 in the morning. And, I mean, it is so packed. And, um... Yeah, I mean, really, you feel like you need a tetanus shot when you get off there. I mean, it's just... Be because the bus is, like, rough around the edges, is that, is that what you're saying? I mean, the so, whole thing, yeah. I mean, you're, it's just, it's, it's a free bus, you know? And, and so this, this touches on another point. I don't feel like the people who are outside, like, I value the people who are outside. I see them as human beings. Some have problems. Right, and so, sometimes those problems are more visible to the broader community because if they have, they're living outside, right? I mean, there are just as many people inside who have a lot more problems they're able to disguise, right? Or, you know, not uh, share with the world. And I feel like there's, there are some people that don't place value in the people who live outside and so, they should be happy that they have a free bus, right? Never mind the fact that it's like 40 people over capacity. I mean, it's completely unsafe. But they have a free bus and they, should, they need to use that. Or, you know, um, I just feel like that's been the attitude about so much. Yeah, I remember, I remember hearing um, some pushback against um, improving the North Boulder Library in um, because worrying about that it would be yet another place. How's it going? Good. What's going on? We're doing an interview, love. Uh, um, uh, any, uh... You're on film right now. Do you know that? We're, record we're recording an interview for a podcast. Right what do you now. need? Talk to me. What do you need? No, we do not have any of that. You don't need that either. You have a good night. And so this is the thing I'm talking about. So we have these, we have people that I'm an advocate for the in-house community, right? I used to be homeless, and so I think a lot of people automatically assume that everything I say about our in-house community or our policy is going to, like, trash it. I mean, you know, or I'm always going to be about, for you know, we need more for this, and we need for the in-house, and we need this. I'm about more effective, right? Yeah. More effective services and about real and raw conversations. And so, like, to see that is just, I mean, that's a dime a dozen right there. Someone coming up to ask you for drugs. Like, this is all day, every day, and it's not limited to people outside. It is people inside as well, which is why I go back to, we have no treatment. There is zero treatment. And check it out. The jail, 
The criminal justice system decriminalized hard street drugs prior to COVID. Okay? Anytime there is criminal uh, decriminalization done by criminal justice system, it automatically increases the in-house community. Do you know why? Because people spend less time in jail. Yeah. Okay, and to me, what that did was send a message to city, the city, the city council, that we are not your shelter, and we are not your treatment facility. And so, and, and that's as it should be. Correct. correct. But, but then but, here we go. We have zero options. Yeah. Right. There is nothing in this community at all. You see all of these little outpatient programs that are, are sprouting up. Um, and those are great for people who have stability like and structure in their lives and can wear clean clothes and take a shower and like get a good night's sleep and have a mom or a dad or friend drive them. Uh, it's not effective for people who are outside. So we have these jail programs who I... I have healthy relationships with, don't get me wrong, but since I've been back for the three years, they're all talking about the same thing, which is reducing recidivism. How do you do that when the bulk of your jail population are in house and there's nowhere to send anybody? So this is why I like another driving force, another, another benefit of why we need, we need sober support and living here. Mm -hmm. And it can't be for six weeks. It has got to be long term. Transitional housing will allow a person to stay for up to two years. Um, can, can we revisit this scenario just a bit? Like, yeah. Um, uh, so I did know you like my? Did you like how I handled that? Well, I, I, I like your. You don't need that shit either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate there's your. A, your, your there's there's an aspect of um, like. I'm like a deer in the headlights in that moment, and yeah, I, don't, sure. I don't know what my responsibility. Oh, mosquito, like right Do now. I? Yeah, there you go. You I don't know it. what my responsibility is as a as a fellow human being. You didn't know how to handle that. Well, and even even kind of thinking about it now, like I don't know what I could offer this young man to help him this evening, except cash. And I I I mean, how do you feel about like if he had asked for cash? Uh, is, is it okay for me to give it to him or is that kind of um, I mean it's uh, okay working. for you to do whatever you prefer to do yeah um, there's a couple of things that people may not know if they see somebody um, out, you know who's outside and you might be concerned about them like let's say they might be having a mental health situation or they're sleeping but they, maybe they don't look safe or they're acting erratically or they're passed out on a sidewalk, whatever the case may be. You can call the police non-emergency and you can request a welfare check. Okay. So that is like a less invasive, they're not showing up with, you know, uh, necessarily the intentions of arresting a person. They're coming to basically check on their overall mental health, um, physical, wellness um should, should we be doing that now um i'm not trying to be well i don't know where this kid yeah. went and um yeah. our chances are probably not far I mean, <laughs> <laughs> probably not far um and so cool um i as a person who used to be in a house i i um i I can say things to people who are outside that wouldn't be appropriate if you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think you would feel comfortable saying any of those things. Yeah, probably. <laughs> right, and so like I, I have the ability to just keep very real with people. Um, even though I was not homeless with him, he probably could tell that I've been around and seen some things. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, but I mean, I think for ordinary people that may be concerned about somebody, um, you know, rather than calling the police to, uh, you know, create a situation where they it's may like pick a up a charge. Yeah, when you're when somebody, you know, mental health or maybe they're too intoxicated or you feel like whatever the case might be, and you're just genuinely concerned, you can call and do a welfare check. Yeah. Okay. okay. What was um, some help maybe that you received? that you really appreciated while you were um, unhoused for those four and a half years? 
Yeah, so while I was also unhoused, I was in like the height of my alcoholism. I was drinking a, uh, a minimum of a uh, gallon of vodka every day. Uh, every wow. every decision I made each and every day um, was guided by that. I mean, every decision. Um, and so what ends up what happened for me, which is I were very relatable to some people who st are still here in Boulder, um, you know, who su struggle with substance misuse, is every day becomes Groundhog Day. It's like that's all you do. It's just like that's all I. I wanted to, I mean, it just, it wasn't even I didn't want to do it. It was like my, I, I just, that's why, I, I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know how my, like, life came to that, but that's where it was. And, um, and so, like I said, they weren't housing people like me at that time. And uh, the municipal court system created a new uh, position uh, called a court navigator. And they hired this woman named Elizabeth Robinson. Now, the interesting thing about Elizabeth was, was that she had previously worked for another resource in town that I didn't really go to too much. I didn't really go to any of those things, you know. Uh, I was rogue, you know. <laughs> but um, I'd seen her, and um, she'd come to see me in jail. And she talked to me about this program, and it was the summer. And I said, you got to be nuts. I'm not leaving Boulder in the summer. <laughs> It's the best time of year. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, you know? And so, you know, fast forward till this was the end of 2016, December, I got frostbite. So I was in the detox. I didn't know I had frostbite. And then I, like, took a sack off, and it was just bad. Went to the hospital, and so Elizabeth came to see me at the detox. The point about Elizabeth Robinson is that while I, after, even after I left to go to that program, even when I was no longer technically her client, she kept in contact with me. And she continued to support me, right? To see how I was doing. Uh, when I was on my own with my housing process, you know, she wrote me, uh, I had to learn how to advocate for myself. Uh, I mean, I had to, really advocate for myself to get into housing and um and from that we just developed a friendship that that woman was was and still is has been absolutely instrumental in my life changing uh today she is on my board oh, nice. oh wow very cool yeah so i mean i think that just i mean brings up a, a just a an important point that I mean one person just one person having patience building trust um, treating as human being like it is you have value I mean just a look I don't know what my life would have looked like without her I could have been I don't know like sleeping under that tree over there today so I mean she didn't do all the hard work uh, but you know, just having that supportive piece, um, and then just, yeah, I mean, be, I, I guess it's just the believing, believing that you can do it, right? So, yeah, she, cool. yeah, cool. she's awesome. Well, and then also she had that institutional support to, to, to do that work, right? So, I mean, it seems like if we um, empower the institutions with enough money and resources and permission to build stuff you know like there's a lot of work that that could go forward if if we sort of like could remove a lot of the barriers is that is that true i don't mean i i guess i'm making yeah i mean i think yeah if the money's put into the right channels and to the right the right institutions i mean yeah. i personally uh you know i think it's time that we um start looking at other yeah some other approaches to to how we're going to make a dent in homelessness uh, because so, it's not working for everybody uh, and I understand there's national models you know that are you know um, pretty much mandated by HUD and, and in order to get their resources you need to play that game I get it but we're also a community yeah. and we need to invest in our people regardless of um, if you like the way they look or you don't uh, or if they live in a tent 
or they live on in North Boulder. You know, uh, we need we're a community, and um, we need to act like one. What are what are your needs right now, your organizations, in order to do the good work that you're doing? Right? What are your barriers, your your organization's unique barriers that so, you need support with? I'll try to keep it simple. <laughs> I have a lot. I have a lot of needs. Um, so I always try to keep staple socks because that's how I started, and so I like to hand out new socks. We do this year round, so weather appropriate socks are key, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we're currently missing a consistent food partner for the first Tuesday of every month. And so um, it's been difficult because of COVID and restaurants, you know, trying to recover from that. And then now you add the can't find employees, you know. Um, so that's another need. Um, our biggest, most, um, my biggest ask and need is that we need a van. We need a van to transport our stuff um, because right now I have four to six cars. Well, I'd say on, on the average, I have four SUVs or a truck coming to load our stuff. So um, a van would be the most helpful. Mm -hmm. And then I could increase my outreach, right? Because then I would, could drive around and uh, I wouldn't just be in one location. Uh, we, I'd always be in that location on Tuesdays. How about cash? Would cash be helpful? Can we? Can we? Yes, can I'll we, definitely. Can I, can yes. I encourage listeners to <laughs> to go to uh, feetforward.org? dot uh, org? Is, yes. is that the website? Yes. And uh, and donate. Is that yes? It? Okay, I'll do that then. We can. Yes. Listeners, go to the uh, <laughs> feetforward dot org. Run! And, uh, run! <laughs> The following is a list of ways you can help unhoused people in our community. One way is to support Feet Forward, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They accept cash donations on their website. You can contact Feet Forward directly to coordinate other kinds of donations. Jen says that they always need good new socks, especially in the winter. They also need a van. They also need a food partner for their hot meal program for the first Tuesday of each month. Please contact Jen for further information. In the episode, I asked Jen about giving cash directly to homeless people. She said that a better option is to give out gift cards to local grocery stores and coffee shops. Another possibility is to give out bus passes. A day pass would be ideal, but unfortunately requires activation and it is time stamped. However, you can buy booklets of one-way local passes at any service desk at most grocery stores in Boulder. Finally, if you are concerned about someone who is experiencing homelessness and may be in a crisis situation, then you can call the Boulder Police Department and request a non-emergency welfare check. This episode of Sharing Boulder was produced by David Adamson and Philip Ogren. Sound and video editing was done by Philip Ogren. The intro music was sampled from Osladum by Gilberto Gill and is available for use under the Creative Commons Sampling Plus license. Please visit us at sharingboulder.us for show notes and previous episodes.